We're going to start uh, our uh, much waited presentation of the day. I want to first say thanks to a few uh, groups on campus that help us organize this event and actually provided the support needed to put the event together. So on behalf of uh, the MAV department, I want to thank the Sagnas QCC chapter, uh, which is co-led by your colleagues, Bianca Sofnowski and myself. I also want to thank the other faculty members who work closely with the Sagnas QCC chapter, Professor Trujillo uh, from biology, uh, Professor Moni Chauhan from the STEM Academy, which is also one of the sponsors, and also somebody who supports the Sagnas QCC chapter activities. Uh, the entire uh, Department of Biological Sciences and Geology is one of the sponsors of the event. Very important, the Faculty Diversity Committee, which is run through the Office of uh, Affirmative Action at the college. They were sponsoring this event and helped co-organize it. And then the many other uh, clubs that are supporting the event. Uh, we have too many to mention, but I just wanted to uh, make sure that we were aware that this is an event that has the support of many groups, departments, and clubs on campus. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. I know it's the crazy, the beginning of the end of the semester. So everything is happening in these two weeks of May. Uh, there were a lot of things actually already scheduled to happen today during this period of time. We organized this rather uh, in the last couple of weeks. So we're actually happy that we were able to pull it together. Uh, we're trying to take advantage of our guest speaker, who happens to be in the New York City area and was very uh, kind to accept the invitation to come to present. But before we introduce the speaker formally, I want to invite our uh, Vice President of Academic Affairs and Provost, Dr. Sandra Palmer, to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, <laughs> and welcome. Um, nice group. Um, I'm happy to be here. And uh, it's really my pleasure, on behalf of the president, President Lynch, and, really, and academic affairs, of course, um, uh, uh, we welcome you here. But we particularly welcome our, uh, our, our guest speaker, um, Dr. Carlos Castillo-Chavez. Um, it, is, is, it is a great pleasure to have you here. As I know, you're, you, not, you do not live in the New York City area. Um, but it's a pleasure to have you here, and it's uh, you know we all look forward to your uh, to your to your talk today. I just briefly, and everybody I'm sure knows, I just want to read um, Dr. Castillo Chavez's um, bio again. So uh, you're you know we're just to kind of prep you for the for the lecture. Um, he received his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees and I'm reading this from here, from three campuses of the University of Wisconsin and has co-authored over 250 publications. Per the Mathematics Genealogy Project, he is among the top 200 mentors of PhD students in the history of mathematics. He was recognized with three White House awards in 1992, 97, and 2011 and served on President Obama's Committee on the National Medal of Science from 2010 to 2015. He is a George Polia lecturer from 2017 to 2019. He is currently a provost visiting professor at Brown University within its Division of Applied Mathematics and Data Science Initiative. He does, his home, though, is at Arizona State University. So I want to welcome uh, welcome you here today. It's a, it's a pleasure having you. Uh, everybody, please enjoy the lecture. Uh, and again, welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. If you can hear me, can you hear me well? Yes. I, but well, first of all, I want to thank you very much for, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk uh, uh, to you. Is, um, I spent 18 years at Cornell University, and one of the reasons I moved to Arizona State University when it was not as well known as now that we had an incredible president for the last 17 years uh, was uh, 
uh, essentially to see can we actually do the things that do we do at institutions like Cornell at public universities. I was trained at a public university, I was educated at a public university. At that time people thought that I was crazy to move, but uh, uh, 15 years later um, uh, everybody has changed their mind because of the things, uh, of course, that Arizona State University has accomplished, but also the things that I've been able to do at the scale that I have been able to do just because I'm part of a, a, a public uh, university. Of course, the issue at public universities are always budgets and resources, so the question is how can we provide a quality education to massive numbers of students uh, with uh, with less resources. That's the challenge of public education and, and we have to be up to it. So I'm gonna give you an idea of a series of programs that I have. Um, let me see. Okay. And let's see. Let me see if I can figure out how to operate this. Okay, there we go. So I'm gonna give you some, some ideas. So I, I'm gonna talk about these programs of mentoring that I have. I have programs of mentoring from high school to the postdoctoral level and beyond. Uh, one of my current postdoc, she was my, uh, I know, have known her since she was 13 years old. <laughs> so this is the way we have built communities of researchers. So I'm gonna tell a few, a few ideas. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about uh, something that is actually very, very critical in mathematics and that uh, um, it is actually very difficult to understand. And uh, it is also very difficult to explain uh, because uh, when you are a mathematician, you have an idea what it is, but when uh, you are not a mathematician, then it becomes more complicated. And that has to do with what Walter Rudin called the most important function in mathematics. I would say it is the, really the key, and that's the exponential function. And the general idea, you want to understand what is the difference between exponential growth and exponential de decay. And everybody that does science, any kind of science, you know that precisely you want to find these transition points with the dynamic changes so that you can actually um, uh, are able to understand uh, uh, different phenomena, to understand what are the keys to parents and ecology, when cancer develops, even when nuclear bombs explode. So that's, that's, that's a key aspect. And, uh, and uh, that was translated later on by Malcolm Gladwell, a New Yorker, well, Canadian New Yorker, uh, into what he calls tipping point. Tipping point is nothing more than the exponential uh, function uh, in, in, uh, uh, when you apply it essentially to a discrete uh, map. So we have here, so what is a tipping point? I, they, I put this the definition from the uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary that I don't think I ever read. So I always ask Senor Google here, and he says the point at which a series of small changes or incidents become significant enough to cause a larger, more important change. Essentially when you go from steady state to exponential growth or to uh, uh, exponential decay, critical for biology. Malcolm Gladwell put it in a more flourish language. So here you talk about this magic moment when, when an idea, trend, social behavior, anything. So he explains everything with the idea of the tipping point. You have read his book, Tipping Point. Uh, so he almost understands it. But it's very interesting, he writes beautiful. What he understands is what, what he has done with this effort, right? he has managed to bring into the everyday lives the concept of exponential change, exponential transition points to exponential change, and in the process he became a millionaire. So understanding exponential uh, growth has its benefits, guys. Okay, and now we use it everywhere, right? So these are some examples. Uh, for example, see, after years of neglect, public higher education are a tipping point, right? Um, and then we have uh, the Trump tipping point, that is one of those every day, right? Um, and so forth. For homicide, has Chicago no tipping point? So this is, this is the general idea, and in biology, this is, this is what it is, and I study contagion, infectious diseases, the spread of ideas, things like that. So the general idea you have is that if we have a population that, for example, um, has no experience the latest strain of influenza, and I just came from Providence, Rhode Island, and I start shaking hands with everybody, and I happen to have influenza, if by the time I leave, I leave uh, two of you with influenza, then, and then uh, uh, and you proceed to infect two other of your friends or colleagues or enemies, doesn't matter, <laughs> then, then you start seeing exponential growth. Of course, eventually you run out of people to infect, so there is a saturation effect. 
So this is the basic reproductive number, exponential growth. But since you apply it to generation to generation of infectious, it becomes a discrete process, right? And this can be summarized in a little curve. That might be a little impressive. But it's called a bifurcation curve and says that when you are here, this is one. So it means that you infect more than one person. Then it, if it is very close to one and you infect more than one person, the spread is slow and eventually you saturate. If you are more effective at infecting people, then you grow faster, always exponential, and eventually saturates. If you are in this region, then essentially nothing takes off. If you don't infect, if you only infect half a person on the average, then things will go down. And, uh, and, and general idea, then you also see, for example, uh, if I'm here, uh, I have to do, so the general question that you have, for example, now that there is the anti-vaccine uh, anti -vaccine problem, is what percentage of the population do I have to vaccinate so that I can be here and not here? That's the key, and this is, these things have been estimated. So all these numbers that you see in the news uh, uh, work that way. Um, you see the movie Contagion, they talk about this concept. It's just everywhere, and I had a movie about that. What, so this is what uh, Blackwell thought that the world was about. Uh, Bla este, Gladwell thought. Gladwell thought that the world was about uh, essentially this way. But it is actually isn't that way. And it is different. It's a little bit more complicated, at least another approximation. But, uh, but it's more difficult to understand. So if you talk to public health officials, to people, they like the other curve because it is easier to understand. The other one says that uh, essentially, if you are here, right, this is the situation where the process of infection or, is, uh, or contagion is at multiple levels. So for example, when you have a disease that is transmitted in more than one way, or, or for example, when, uh, when, uh, when you talk about the spread of fanatic behaviors, you are in a community where some people are um, very good spreaders also, incredibly spreaders also, more skeptical, but you are in constant uh, process with this community that might accelerate your process of conversion into a more fanatic behavior, more religious behavior, whatever it is. If you do that, then essentially, if this is great, and one, then you grow, but actually you grow faster than exponential. This is what we see with the spread of ecstasy use and many drugs, for example. And, if, uh, and on the other hand, if you want the community that you create is so powerful that you have to go all the way below one, so you have to have really effective programs if you want to eradicate them. It's not like with uh, the other model that I saw, you have to do, be sure that a person doesn't infect more than one person. Here you have to be sure that a person doesn't infect more than half a person or a quarter person, depends how it is. But there is something else. It also says that uh, if you are here, uh, the, the, the problem disappears or the advantage disappears, but if you move here, even though it's less than one, you can grow also exponentially. So for example, that's what we might have when a group of, uh, um, a group from uh, uh, people, let's say, with HIV come to a community and you have excellent programs, but there are so many that suddenly arrive that they can spread an epidemic even you have an excellent health system. Okay, so, so, um, so I try to connect this and, and actually written and it, you know, you like to read differential equations and, and models and that. We have um, some papers with a lot of theorems about this where it's not just, just uh, middle. Uh, and what is a meritocracy and a, and a social system? And, I've been very interested in this. I, you know, I, I, I was spent a year at MIT as a Martin Luther King professor, and, and actually uh, MIT is a university that actually gives access to a lot of people. But it is not a meritocracy. I don't know a meritocracy yet. And uh, so essentially, this is some sort of the point. This is the promises for our democracy cannot be fulfilled selectively. Therefore, a social justice educational model that does not account for initial conditions. We don't, you know. Uh, um, and the recent scandal about the, uh, the, the, uh, the children of, of rich people getting into college, even if they don't want to go to college, right, just because they can pay, or the legacies that are pervasive in the universities where over 30% of the people get admitted just because somebody in their family went to these universities, it's, it's, it just shows that, in fact, the system is not a meritocracy. 
So family background, quality of schools, right? Whether you go to a school system that spend $25,000 per student or whether you go to school system that spend $4,000 per student. Nobody wants to think about this because all of us want naturally advantages, legal advantages, I hope, for our children, right? That's what we all want. So, so if our children, for example, get an SAT score of 1150 and we have somebody from one of the uh, uh, poorest areas of, uh, of uh, I don't know, the Virginia or something like that, that, ha that gets a, a thousand, which student is better and which student is more promising, right? If it is our children, certainly it's gonna be our children, right? But, but if it is, we never, we don't even want to think about this inequality. This is an issue that doesn't enter, it's, it's very normal. So it's, it's talking about these issues that we don't have a first system, that these inequalities persist, is very troubling Right? Because we immediately reflect on our own situation, the situation of our children and things like that, and the advantage that we want to talk. But I think that that should not prevent us from recognizing this difference and trying to find some ways to mitigate their effect. So the other model that does not eliminate the deleterious impact of preconceived conditions, notions of ability. When I arrived to the United States, uh, and uh, I worked in a factory, and then I went to Stevens Point, Wisconsin, which is a, a college that pretty much admits everybody. Otherwise, I would have not been able to go to college. Right? It was very interesting. The perception in the 70s was that all Mexicans were very lazy. And they would tell you, say, Carlos, why are Mexicans so lazy? 20 years later, says, why are Mexicans so hard workers? It has changed. You know, They take all the jobs that nobody wants to in, in Wisconsin, meatpacking plants. You were Mexican, they will hire you on the spot. They wouldn't even ask you anything. right? because they people that were behind. So it's very interesting how these preconceived notions determine a lot about how people feel about you. And, uh, and, and, they, disemp and, and, and they disempower you a priori, you know, though, uh, because, because uh, 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 those uh, create a history of exclusion. So a, a model that asks us, this is common. There are people that get up, we can function at this level on tests we fix K through 12. And we continue to talk about that. No, that nothing can work at our level because K through 12 doesn't work, right? What if they are your children in K through 12? I said, you have to wait until your great grandchildren, until we feel K through 12, and then your children are gonna be able to have opportunities, or grandchildren are gonna have opportunities to go to college. It doesn't work. We have to work with the students that we have, we have to create opportunities for the students that we have, and we have to promote the students that we have, that's the students that we have. Certainly, when I was at Cornell, well, you know, uh, most of the students had uh, uh, no issues about that. They had been trained for the SAT test. They had taken three loans of AP courses. They had gone to summer camps and things like that. Um, it is not so difficult to teach that, right? But my specialty since then have see, has been to train a school students from non-selective schools, including obviously community colleges, and show that they can do the same or better. And it hasn't been difficult. And all you need is good mentors, time, dedication. You know, many of us remember the time when we had a, a great school teacher that was very devoted and wait long hours and things like that. And I think some of that has been lost. I think some has been lost for many, 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 many reasons, right? But I, I think that in many, uh, in many public universities, that's a must. If you're gonna be a faculty at a public university, you have to have devotion for the students, you have to have dedication. You're not gonna be able to promote all of them or resolve all of the problems, right? But you have to be there. You have to be there, you have to listen, you have to pay attention to them. You have, you know, and most of them, if they don't make it, it's not going to be because they were lacking uh, the inspiration from some people. It's typically because there are disasters in the family, the parents lost their employment, because the parents got divorced. Trillions of things that happen that uh, if you are in a family with more resources also affect you, but not as extensive and in a such a defining way as if you are in these communities. And we forget that, we just forget that, you know, just, oh, these students are not prepared, they didn't do the homework, um, he's sleeping in class, and we don't know that that guy worked all night, and things of that sort. And this is the kinds of things that we can't forget, this is just not, just the way, because most of the students in the United States, the overwhelming number of the students in the United States are gonna be trained by public school universities and community colleges. We are the backbone of the educational system in the country. You know, the number of students that get the, the degrees from elite school is a minuscule part of the production of 
people uh, that we need to run the country and to, uh, and to continue to be successful. So we are the important ones, right? And if we waste, uh, you know, 50% of the students, that's a great loss. If we waste 75%, that's a disaster. So we have to figure out how to create opportunities to, to do it. So, uh, so essentially, a system where inequality is pervasive cannot be called a meritocracy. We don't live in a meritocracy. We aspire to be a meritocracy. But uh, what we mean by that depends on all sorts of issues that essentially avoid discussion of what a true meritocracy is. Since I work on epidemic models and one of the things I did an epidemic model that I talk about that. I, um, so I, I said this is when students come to school, how do you create these communities so cooperative learning and things like that? And we have a paper with all the mathematics that you want to, guys, if you want to look at this. Uh, so we have the naive susceptible that enter into the door. Then we have some students that believe us sometimes they are semi-convinced and they tell you know it's good to actually learn how to write. <laughs> or is, you know, yeah, you, you should learn some coding or whatever that is, right? And then there are the completely convinced that tell you, uh, no, you, you have to learn how to write. You have to learn how to do this. This is very important. You're going to get opportunities, right? And these are communities that interact with each other. And this affect these guys, but this also affect these guys, and this affect these guys. That's what a community is. And what we have done is we have done some models where, uh, essentially, we now try to measure the number of secondary conversions generated by a typical mentor in a population of mostly susceptibles. And by typical mentor might be a semi-convinced or a convinced student or could be a faculty or whatever. If it was an epidemic model, if it was R0 less than one, right, that's no exponential growth, then nothing happens. If it was uh, other, then uh, essentially you will get exponential growth and you will create a community. Uh, so under the typical model, you have to be here, and then if it, unless it's very large, the community is very small, and it could be relatively easily destabilized or destroyed. Uh, but that's not what happens when you have social interactions. You create communities like this, and they can persist. And even the resources are less, they can still survive. So um, say, well, that sounds very good, and things like, well, I'm going to show you how we have done this, and how we have done this for many years. Okay. Anyway, right, right time for my I'm okay. I'm gonna before I this. I'm, I'm gonna so I'm gonna ask you an example that I don't know you have seen about. I I I um I was an intermediate slide that I missed. Uh, this is this is the situation what happened in Arizona, and I don't know you have seen the uh, uh, the it's, it's not the movie, it's a documentary called Underwater Dreams. You haven't seen Underwater Dreams. That was uh, a documentary that was shown in the, in the White House, and all the AMC movie theaters show it for free. And it's something that should be done. And there are cases like this often, often. And these are four students of Carl Hayden High School in Phoenix, Arizona. In fact, I just gave one to the Mexican Institute of Studies, one copy of the film at uh, Lehman College where I was yesterday. And, and these students were students that were uh, 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 essentially, mostly undocumented, there is uh, over 3,000 students. It is considered a low performing school, Cal Hayden School. And then there were two professors, just like any other professors. Uh, we want to say two white professors, you want the high school, two, fact, two teachers. They say, let's do something, so let's create a, not a remedial course. I hate remedial courses. I just don't know what they exist, frankly, but you know, I know there is prejudice. You know, if, you know, so if I want to learn algebra, what would I teach you? I teach you calculus because calculus is algebra. You can, that's what I would do. But you might not learn al uh, calculus, but at least you are not bored because you think you are learning calculus. Right? But you give, repeat you the same algebra course 15 times. It just becomes like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't want to be there anymore. So, so what we do in this, in this, in this uh, particular, they decide to create an aquatic robotic team, and they put ads all over the school, and only four students showed up. One that was flunking math, the other that didn't want to go home because guns were trying to recruit him and he was afraid, or that his parents were being evicted, and I forgot what the story was. They were not the best students. And all of them wanted to join the program because they didn't want to go home. They preferred to stay in school than to go home. This, this was the basis of that idea. Um, so what did these teachers do? They said, well, you know, you're not doing well in math. You know, you, you, this is not for you. No, they took those because those are the students that they got. And that's exactly what we are supposed to do. And six months later, they have designed an incredible aquatic robot. They make one mistake. 
what they should have said is, if we beat with this robot any un every university at a, at a college competition, will you admit us in an engineering program? And everybody would have said yes, but they didn't say that. They made that tragic mistake. So they went to this aquatic robotic competition. They had to raise money to do the robot, like $5,000 or something like that. The other robots that they can, people like MIT and things like that, with 30,000 robots, they entered this competition. They had to have an exam. They had to have a translator because to be sure that they had done it. Uh, to make the story short, they beat every school, including MIT. They came back the next year. I believe they finished in third place. They came the next year. They finished in second place. And said, so, well, that's a great accomplishment, right? Immense accomplishment. How, how can four undocumented students that are doing poorly in STEM beat engineering schools and an engineering project? I just want somebody to explain me. Is that the only experience, we don't know how to judge talent, and we don't even want to believe it. That's the problem. So that's what this document. And I'll tell you what, 10 years later, Ah, when uh, Mary, uh, Mary uh, Masio, the woman that did the movie, they put it at different colleges. The last part of the, of the movie is when they go and visit, 10 years later, the students at MIT. They invited them. They can take airplanes, they can take buses, they can take any, so they, uh, they could take buses. So they went there and they expected that they were gonna shop. And then you see the guys from MIT working on Google, working on this, working on that. These guys, some flipping burgers, only one of them finished college and things like that, and they, uh, and, and they are right there. They show that scene in the several colleges as a preview for the movie, and the students would come and tell him, please, please don't present that part. That's what they would tell. And Mary Masha said, no, I'm, of course I'm not gonna remove it from the movie. My question is, what are you going to do about this? And that's the question. You know, Martin Luther King put it very well. What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about these things? So that's what, that was what this movie uh, ba was about. And then you say, well, that's a great story. They, well, they did something amazing, right? They became leaders of the dreamers. They changed a the country, till flipping burgers. And their high school has become one of the best schools. They beat everybody in every robotic competition, male, female teams. They win all competitions. Nobody can beat these guys, right? With the same teachers, with the same salaries. <laughs> with the same students, with the same equipment. Money hasn't flooded the, the, the school just to see this what a great story. So you're gonna see a little clip about that. I think this won an Oscar uh, as, the, as a documentary. So, but, but there are stories, I think. We have debate teams that have beaten every debate where African Americans have gone and done this. We just don't want to acknowledge, right, and highlight that uh, the, the, with so many disadvantages, they can shine so profoundly and so deeply. And that fact that we don't understand that because we don't want to really dig into what are the reasons that uh, we cannot really um, uh, tell about talent or because sometimes developed talent takes some time. We are impatient. We want people to come and be stars from the beginning and things like that. This is uh, the ASU charter, one of the reasons that I came to, to Arizona State. It, the president of Arizona State has been named one of the 50th persons more influential in the whole world in all areas. He was number 44, the number one was Bill Gates or something like that, and then he went up 44. He has transformed education, he has created tremendous programs where you work at a Starbucks, you get a degree from a Starbucks, you can uh, Adidas, they have similar wealth, programs online, and he has said, uh, and he has made a marvelous institutions where you admit about 5,000 students with A's, but you have about 5,000 students that are be average in the schools and so forth and every year now they graduate 80,000 students. They have more A students than Brown, Princeton, Harvard, and all of those, but they also have a more inclusive community. They have several campuses and many, many four things like that. And the charter says this, AU is a comprehensive public research university measured not by whom it excludes, but rather by whom it includes and how they succeed advancing research and discovery of public value and assuming fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities it serves. And it has transformed the city of Phoenix and all the greater Phoenix area and the state of Arizona. 
As a result of that, I established a center, the Mathematical Computational Biology Center, este, the uh, Mathematical Computational Modeling Science Center, that I named after one of my mentors, Simon Levine. And the general idea about this center is how can we uh, do not just what centers do, which is separate instruction from research, mentoring from research, but do something different, something that they do somewhat at Cornell University, which I was there. And, but now I wanted to do it in a different, uh, in a different way. So this is the center is a mo uh, approach now that handles students from high school to the postdoctoral level and beyond, and handles high levels of research activity. So, so the Simon Levine Center, and we were recognized by, uh, by Barack Obama at one point, it has a high school program that is now 30 years in the MTBI, which is an undergraduate research program. Uh, we have a Latin American consortium where I go and interact with people with Ecuador in Colombia primarily, but also Costa Rica and other places, El Salvador. In, in El Salvador, there is a center dedicated to math and violence. I, I, it's named after me. We have a PhD program, we have an undergraduate program, we have in some bridges to the uh, program doctoral, and we have uh, the NSF, in, we had an NSF research experiences for, for graduate students that we took them to Colombia primarily. The high school program was started about 30 years ago by uh, a professor from Arizona, Joaquin Bustos. Um, his father's were, parents were custodians of um, middle school, he grew up poor, poor there and he went to do that and, and then he created this program. He tried to take me from Cornell to Arizona State to work with him, he said, I do this part, you do this part. And I thought, I'd say no in 91, I said no in 97, 2003, I said yes. And uh, six months before I moved to Arizona State University, he died in a car accident. So that's why one of my titles is Joaquin Bustos, Junior Professor of Math Biology. And these are some of the students, and I'll just show you some of the results quickly about this. They receive university credit, and an ASU GPA. So they, take, they come sometimes uh, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Some of them can earn up to 11 credits. Uh, live on ASU Tempe campus in a student resident course. Take classes with ASU math faculty, and we always choose the best faculty. And it is free. So we have to tuition, meals, room, and board. That's what we provide them. Um, some of the courses in 2019, you have the sessions that we have, Calculus 1, Calculus 2. We have an applied math program and we have college algebra and pre-calculus. We used to have other things like physics and things like that, but utilizing the last became more complicated. Uh, this is a day in the life of the students, lecture, tutoring, quizzes, individual tutoring sections, activities, computer labs, tutoring sessions, activities. They work all day for all this time. At the beginning, many of them want to go home, and they, at the end, nobody wants to go home, okay? <laughs> it's just very interesting. Uh, the applied math research students use math software to perform research on real applied problems. Group will present findings in a symposium. There is a study that a PhD student is going to do about why this works uh, in, in this particular summer. Students are doing that in math education. Eligibility. You have to be an Arizona State, qualified for Arizona State resident tuition, so we can give you the, the tuition. Uh, must be at least a high school summer. Comply three years of math classes by May 2019, and we recruit all across this, the state, and we take primarily students from low-performing high schools. They have good grades. That's the only purpose. You have good grades, you know, you you, you qualify by that. Uh, so it must have at least a big grade level in all math and science classes, and the seniors may attend if they have been accepted by Arizona State University. These are some of the things that the the, the groups that they have taken. They have. Uh, ethnicity, you can see this is uh, Native Americans, this is African Americans. This pretty much represents the, the uh, ethnicity of the state. Uh, this is Asian Americans, and this is um, uh, white Americans, I think, and this is, and this is the uh, Hispanic population that we, we do there. And these are the courses that they taught. Precalculus is the most popular, uh, and then Intermediate Algebra, College Algebra, Calculus 1 and 2, uh, those are the most popular. Uh, who had uh, overview, this is 50% has been female participants, 86% received a B of grade or better on the courses that they took, 35% participated two or more summer sessions, 80% first generation students since 2006, 100% graduate from higher school, 99 attendance to college, 59 attended, percent attended ASU. So these are some of the results. Uh, where, uh, Current uh, students enroll at ASU, 182 students enroll at ASU, 30 are graduate students, and are 
high school students enroll at the university, 70% pursuing science, technology, engineering, or mathematics majors, and 54% female students. And 60% are enrolled in the Barrett Honor College, which is, according to the New York Times newspaper, that you may know is something fantastic. <laughs> uh, retention rates, as you can see here, uh, and then the GPA by students that attend the My Science Honors programs that they do not attend the My programs. See the difference, the green ones are the ones that attended the My Science Honors program. These are the students that nobody wanted, that thought they were terrible, that they shouldn't go to college. They do this. And they see the retention rates at the university, how they have been increasing and increasing and increasing as the population goes from 50,000 to 75, 80,000 students, more campuses, retention increases, level of employment increases. The university has been named the, the most innovative university in the country four years in a row, on top of, of, of course, obviously every university. Uh, what degrees that they have earned? Uh, liberal arts, engineering, education. So this is at ASU, uh, uh, over a thousand people have earned their degrees. Uh, uh, and uh, alumni earned their degrees, said on the graduate degrees earned, 183 uh, uh, graduate degrees, uh, multiple degrees, uh, Barrett Honor Scholars degrees, 70% graduated with a three point G G uh, grade point average or higher, 42% graduated uh, cum cum laude, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic numbers, right? This is, will be proud. Uh, and it's just participation in this program that made it possible. What about other universities? They go to bad universities like Harvard and UCLA and Caltech, Princeton. They get accepted and they, they go. Students that we have never been accepted otherwise. They we hadn't even thought about that. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, how many are attending different institutions? 61% females. Uh, and how many, almost 1,000, have earned their degrees from outside institutions? These are high school students. Where do they work? You name it. They work whatever you want to do, okay? They get good jobs. Most of the students that come to Arizona State, for some reason, they go to aerospace engineering. Most of them. They didn't even know what it was. They entered into the program, they made people, there is a nice community, now they're going to aerospace engineering. My undergraduate program. Uh, I started this at Cornell in 1996, and then uh, moved to Los Alamos, and then to Arizona State University. What is the model that we use? The model that we use the students, the undergraduate students, decide what is the research agenda. We don't have a loose of problems and answers, like, you know, calculus, okay, oh, the answer book. No, we don't. So they choose whatever they want to. They just have to find three other students that work with them. And after they choose whatever they want to, then we have the obligation to show them, but well, they are filming this, how stupid we are as a faculty, that as soon as they ask us something that we don't know about, we don't know what to do about it. So we have people that have a, told us, we want to study the dynamics of bulimia. And we say, what is bulimia? And why does somebody in mathematics wants to study bulimia? What is the impact of alcohol on the brain? Where do I start? Now how do I help them? How do I show these students that are much smarter than they are? Well, we aren't. So we sit down and study and work and things like that until we write all these projects. And then later on, it has worked so well, so amazingly well, that we're trying to understand theories to see why it works. And we have written some papers involving the different uh, uh, thoughts of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of understanding that provided Albert Bandura won the National Medal of Science when I was in the committee, Bikoski, Piaget. Uh, but we have combined with this contagion effect and how you create these communities because we're trying to do something at a bigger scale. It's not something based on individuals. Some questions, this is a blind student that asks, how does NTBI work? Can we form cooperative uh, communities of learning? And that's, uh, that's, uh, and that's the model that I showed you with the backward bifurcation, that was, came out of this. And there is a math paper in a very prestigious math journal with all sorts of results and theorems that, that shows why it works. Uh, other people say, uh, how can we stop the spread of ecstasy? And they found out that it grew at a rate of 400%. Um, uh, Ebola. The first study of Ebola, mathematical Ebola, was done by these students. They are smarter than anybody. They thought about Ebola before anybody. And then wrote a paper in 96, which has, uh, you know, beginning. They write another in 99. Eventually that got published. That has over 400 citations. So these are some of the papers. It might too fat uh, 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 bulimia as an epidemic. Uh, that was written by four women. The surprising. One of them is now a professor at Brown, other works in a chemical company, other was in a Hispanic race, uh, serving institutions, uh, uh, and so forth. 
So, and this is the stuff that I told you about theorems, community resilient in coalition learning, and then this, this was appeared in discrete and continuous dynamical systems. We have written lots of papers. This is the class of 1996. Um, I don't, Mercedes, I don't think you were in this picture, but I'm not sure. Hi, I'm too far, and I don't have my glasses. I don't know. She might be in this picture. So, she must be in this picture. So, so she must be, you have to look it very strongly. Um, uh, 507 on the graduates, 420 US, 290 on the represented uh, minorities, 78 attended multiple times, over 180 students mentors, they have written over 220 technical reports that have produced hundreds and hundreds of papers. And these are the PhDs, right? Hispanics, Latinos, etc. almost nine, 90 on the represented minority, over 90 of represented minorities actually, 97. And uh, most over the last past years, 160 people have gotten the PhD. At Cornell, we had 23, 23 18 URMs. At Iowa, 11. So we have special institutions at ASU, have 56. In the new program that I created, it has 39 PhDs, 26 on the represented minorities, 70% of, of represented minorities. They get jobs at, they, they want to get rich, they get jobs at Goldman Sachs. They get, some of them become professors. Whatever they want to do, they, 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 they manage to do. And this is the, the areas. This is PhD degree, applied math, mathematics, math, bio, biometry, biostatistics, other. And the other is engineering degrees, PhDs, computer science, epidemiology, African-American studies, um, atmospheric, uh, oceanic uh, sciences, chemistry. So you study mathematics, you can do a PhD in everything. And this is the, the door to do that. This is the class of, uh, went with me to Los Alamos. Uh, Mercedes knows all of this. This woman crossed the Arizona desert at age 15. Maybe now she's a tenure professor at UC Davis. And we have similar studies from all of these guys here. All of them finished their PhDs. Sara Del Valle, uh, now director program at Los Alamos. She wasn't a good student. And then suddenly she became good. Now she directs a research program at Los Alamos. Um, Filipino, Mexican, American now. He's an assistant professor of personalized medicine at North Carolina State. Johnny Guzman, Cal State, Los Angeles, now tenure professor at Brown. He Brisa started, hmm? He started at a community college. He started, oh, he started in a community college. I, I had Brisa Sanchez. Uh, uh, she uh, was University of Texas El Paso. Uh, then tenure professor at Michigan. Now is a, uh, endowed professorship at Drexel to solve the two-body problem. Miriam Nuno crossed the desert at age 15. She probably also started a community college and things like that. Now tenure professor at UC Davis. Johnny Guzman, I met him when he was a manager of Wendy's, 19, married, Colombian. And I talked to him for 10 minutes and said, this guy is good. And I said, how much do you make at Wendy's? I said, I pay you the same thing if you go to college. And he agreed. Now he's a professor at Michigan. It's a true story. I've noticed uh, uh, Emilia Huerta Sanchez, also this woman that wrote the paper on bulimia. And she just got a, 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 a tenure track position at Brown. She has an NIH grant, he has an NSF grant, he has an international grant. She's going to be a star. And she wrote a fantastic paper, a fantastic paper. You have seen this Hidden Women movie? Sorry. Well, she wrote a paper of Hidden Women in Genomics with lots of women work in the production of genomic papers. They did all the calculations and they are just acknowledged. So they went and looked at their situation of women in the 70s and they wrote this marvelous paper. So this is what these women bring. Gerardo Chawel, he's now head, chair of the Department of Population and Health Sciences. And uh, he wrote uh, probably the most critical paper on SARS in 2004. Uh, Karen Rio Soto, uh, Puerto Rican. I admitted her to the program, and then she said that she, uh, 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 later on, I found out this many years later, that uh, her fiance said, you can go. You know, I'm the man of the house. You have to stay in Puerto Rico. You stay in Puerto Rico. So she dumped him. She went to Cornell, got his PhD, eventually found a, a, a good man and has now two children, and she's a full professor at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and she comes and participates and runs on the program. Uh, Ryan Hernandez, and then he is now, uh, at, uh, after getting tenure at U uh, University of California, San Francisco, he decided to move to Canada, okay, it's proven that uh, uh, Mexicans can survive the cold weather. <laughs> Daniel Rios Doria, he always wanted to, to be in industry. 
he got uh, a Goldman Sachs position. They gave him 50,000 signing bonus, and he didn't like to. They didn't want to let him go. And Goldman Sachs, you want to go, didn't. But he left. He always wanted to go with Disney. He's working with Disney. <laughs> uh, uh, this is Peru and America. He started also at Goldman Sachs. Two of the, they did the thesis in epidemiology. They didn't do finance or anything. They, did, they studied diseases and things like that. And uh, last time I came to New York, you know, maybe about six years ago, he went me and picked me up with his $200,000 car that he just has taken out of the dealer. He couldn't drive. I thought we were going to die there. He was driving and, you know, accelerating and couldn't manage his car. But, but very successful. We have the David Blackwell series that we started to honor the foremost African-American mathematician and the foremost Chicano mathematician. And the people that have won this award has become very important. And all of this came out of these uh, efforts. Uh, my research is multiple directions because I pay attention to the undergraduates, because I listen to their crazy ideas and say, how can we do something about this? So I have written many books about that. Um, and, uh, and as I said, we have gotten many recognitions. This was, was important because it was for the program. Thank you very much. <laughs> so do you have any questions or anything? Yes. I'm sorry I went too fast, maybe, but I was worried about uh, not letting you have your lunch or something like that. <laughs> we have pizza, by the way, if anybody wants to grab food. Any questions for Carlos Castillo, Charlie? Or comments? So what do you get the money? Oh, they, they always ask me that oh, question. In fact, um, <laughs> in fact they, they, uh, we just wrote a paper for a volume, and, and they made us they made us review and review, and I finally figured out they wanted to know precisely where the money come from. That was the end. Uh, in 1996, 95, the president of SACNAS uh, was Bill Bellis, a mathematician. He went to Cornell and said, Carlos, este, I had organized the Northeast chapter of SACNAS. You hear at Cornell, they said the first chapter of SACNAS. I actually had that, and I had a regional meeting. I think you might have attended there. No, no, no. no. I had a real, and it was larger than Sagnas. So eventually I had to make it disappear because I don't want to compete with Sagnas. But of course now Sagnas is gigantic, okay. But we had that. And, and he went there and said, and, and, and he brought the head of the National Security, uh, chief of the Division of Mathematical Sciences. And we had posters and things like that because I had a community of people from uh, the Northeast and then he said, uh, Carlos, uh, you start a program, we'll give you $100,000. I said, OK, I'll think about it. Bill Bellis essentially said, you have to do something. So then um, we wrote an NSF grant. Uh -huh. And then uh, we got probably another 100000 And then, um, and then the Cornell put, I think, 70000 or something like that. So that's the way we started. In the first year, we had 36 students. And they kept renewing them. And then as the students kept progressing, we had a we have unlimited Sloan fellowships for minority students. Students could, you know, uh, students that uh, obviously were doing great, they will get. So when we admitted a student in graduate school, and that program of Sloan minority fellowships still persists at Cornell, and they won an NSA, uh, a presidential award also because of their works. But it has not been so much in math; it has been in engineering, and engineering has been more entrepreneurial, more interesting about this. So I will do it. So so. So the way it works, and it is, it is, very, it is very unfortunately, is that um, this, this work in general, in general is not uh, value by many institutions. It's just general value. And, uh, and, and there is the perception, which I think is changing, but it was more pervasive before, right? That if you start getting involved with a lot of minority students, is because you cannot make it as a researcher. You know, obviously, I wasn't teaching 24 hours or anything like that, uh, like the, the here. It, that's, that's, that's just crazy. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, but, but anyway, but that's, I mean, if you want to do something intellectual, that's just, just very, just nearly impossible. But, but, uh, but this is general idea. And, and you had situations of people, young people that got very desperate, that want to help minority students, and they sacrificed their careers. And so mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I knew that if I don't continue to do research up to this point, pretty quickly I would be labeled, right, uh, 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 no, uh, I'm a minority mathematician, and I'm a mathematician that happens to be a minority, which is very different. So, so that, was, that, was, that was the general idea. And then at the time, uh, 
when I went from Cornell to Arizona State, I wasn't just gonna go to, to just to get a bigger salary. So I negotiated some package and then I made some marks. I happened to hit the best president by accident. I thought he was great, but I didn't know it was gonna be a giant. And then I, I said, I'm gonna do this and this, and five, seven years, by five years I had done it, and then I keep putting different landmarks to do that. And then um, they keep wanting me, once in a, say, why, why am I a brown? They treat me very well. But then they get worried when I go somewhere else. And that guarantees that I get money for a few more years. <laughs> Until I get too old and they say, he's not gonna go anywhere, so we're gonna then start cutting your budget. This is the way it works out, right? Because none of this is institutionalized. And this should be institutionalized, particularly in community college and four-year college. This should be part of the budget, this should be part of the process, this should be part of the involvement. And of course, you should apply for grants and things like that yeah, to pre begin the process of institutionalization. But then the, the, this should be very important because this is what really gets the, move, the students moving to the next level, and all of you know that. Too long of an answer, sorry. No, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm a little confused about the method. Yes. The student comes to Arizona. Yes. I presume he enrolls or she enrolls in regular classes. Then, so they're mixed with everybody else. Yes. Uh, what is it that sets the students you're talking about apart? Are you giving them research classes? What ah. Is, what is, how does it go about? No, for the high school students, we do what all the middle, upper middle class parents do with their children. We give them experiences over three summers before they start high school, two or three. And that, that changes everything. So that happens at the high school? At the high school. This is 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Some of them come for one. But that changes everything. That, this, this long difference of an economic support and opportunity gets shattered by, 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 this, by this process. At the undergraduate level, I, it's, it's national. This is national. And I also bring, actually, a lot of international students. But I have undergraduates, students driving the research, and I have a bunch of graduate students, postdoc, and faculty that are stopped doing research. They go there, and two, three years later, they start producing like crazy. So this is what we do, because uh, typically in math, for example, you go and ask oh, the professor, what is an important problem? Can you give me this? And they say, I don't want to hear about ring theory anymore in my life. And just, uh, here, uh, here you start getting into new areas, so, so, and, and you see undergraduates producing papers that get, get, get published in some of the best journals. And you can participate in that, and you start learning new things. And you, know, you don't want to do any more, I don't know, uh, non-commutative ring theory or something like that. Now you can do other things, and you can work and be, and be progressive. So I have people that write NSF career awards, going and spending summers there to have their program so that they can complete the other part, the broader participation part of the NSF career. There's a person that went, uh, David Hiveler, he went three straight summers until he got the award. So they do all of this, and literally, I mean, there's, we have students that have to come through this program that said, people said they were not very good, that graduate with seven, eight publications. It's not complicated, but it requires time, right? And it requires to move in out of your comfort zone. The biggest problem that we have in academia is how do we move ourselves out of our comfort zone? And what moves me out of my comfort zone is the students, when they ask questions and I don't know. And then you become competitive. Well, let's hope, let's work, let's, and they teach me, and they say, ah, I thought, guy, I thought you were very good. You have won these awards, and I can do this better for you, and you cannot do this, and this is a better idea than yours. This is very important. But if, if I talk to them about the things that I know, they think that I'm a god. And that's one of the big mistakes that we make in education. That was the model. So all these students come from all over the country, and now we're also bringing international students. I have a huge list of Chinese graduate students that want to come. They will pay anything. I can do that. They want to do that because learning how to do research uh, just by starting with a question, scientific question, not a mathematical question, is most people don't do. In the sciences, they do this all the time. But in mathematics, no. This is not the case, and that's why people cannot work in applications. And that's why sometimes physicists are very equipped to actually get involved in these issues, because they actually solve problems. Now, the students that I work with, they get involved in this. That doesn't mean that I want them to abandon mathematics. Some of them, most of them want to solve social problems. And they think that mathematics, studying set theory, uh, studying, I don't know, group theory, that that's not gonna help them. 
when they come here, they realize that the more math that they know, the better. So we have students that have come in the program saying, I'm not going to do math because I don't see the value. And then they go and work with Eli Stein at Princeton and get the PhD in harmonic analysis. Because now they realize that, yes, math has value even if I don't find a direct application. They remain that the love for mathematics is the love for something good. So there are many reasons. I had trillions of examples of that. I, I, I just wanted to address one thing. Uh, it's, a research, it's a summer research program. So okay. they are in the summer. Now, once they connect, I think some of them go to start in Arizona or go to places where they have colleagues that are willing to take them. And it's a, it's a long-term mentoring experience. Yeah, uh, it all starts in yeah. the summer. Yeah, we have a community of 500 people. We talk to each other. If you go and talk almost to any Latino math biologist in the country, probably 75% of them went through my, through my summer undergraduate program. And many of them come as graduate students two or three times. Purdue sends their math students, graduate students, to find a thesis topic in my undergraduate program. University of Florida sends their graduate students to my summer undergraduate program to find thesis topics. Because the professor is going to do, I study with this dynamical system. What if this is unbounded? What? And, and then they don't see the value. So they send them there. Beautiful mathematics sometimes come out of that. But, but that's, that's the process. And, and as I say, I have many faculty. The former chair of Howard University was a very good researcher. He started going to there. He doubled his productivity. And he was doing things related to his thesis all his life. And now he has a broad portfolio of research. It helps to pay attention to undergraduates and try to help them do what they want to do. That's my point. <laughs> and of course, they need support. And once we formulate the model mathematically, then you know, if it is a dynamical system, oh, she knows dynamical system. If it is a stochastic process, now you have an exit. The problem is how you formulate the question. And then the machinery is that, that we know how to do. Any other questions that you might have? I got you bored completely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.